Hello and welcome. This is Social Studies, Voices Across America. I'm Bill Wood. I'm Peter Goldsmith. Today, we want to help you keep up with the crazy headlines that are coming fast every day. The headlines surrounding the president's constant tweets that can distract voters getting ready for the election on November 3rd. Our first topic today is the president's constant fears derived from the headlines, then the tweets he uses to distract voter attention from those headlines, and finally, will any supporters jump ship between now and and the election on November 3rd. Peter, you've done enormous research on a key headline that's troubled the president, the book from his niece, Dr. Mary Trump, Too Much and Never Enough. Yeah, Bill, you know, there are several things at play here. The first thing is, I think what the president's doing, and I don't think he's a stupid man. I don't agree with his politics, of course, but I think he knows what he's doing. He's a con man. He's always been a con man, and he's in for the con right now. So what he's doing is shifting our attention the way a magician does, a sleight of hand magician, a presto digitate. He's making us look one way while he's doing something the other way. Ignore the man behind the green curtain, like Uh, from the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Now, this thing is a false flag operation. A false flag is defined as an operation or an act committed with the intent of disguising the actual source of responsibility. You know, all through his presidency in the last three and a half years, anything he disagree with, whether it's right or not, is false news if he doesn't like it. I think the public realizes, get out of here. Science is science. You know, H2O is water. Let's hope, Peter. He was behind in all the polls in 2016, and now who knows what's going to happen on November 3rd? Well, we don't know, but here's the point, Bill. I think if everyone just stays logical and just looks at the facts, false news, if it's H2O, it's water. Whether it's in Iowa, Afghanistan, or Addis Ababa, it's water. Whether he likes it or he doesn't. So what happened here with this book is Mary Trump, who is a niece of the president, has obviously known him and known the family. She's part of the family for years and years and has published a book chronicling his psychological makeup. Remember, she's a clinical psychologist. She's an observer and she does it clinically. And she's brought up a ton of facts about him and what he's done as a young man, even how cold he is, how manipulative he is and how uncaring he is. And and he he went deep into the court system to keep this book from coming out. Absolutely. did. So what does he do when it comes out? A false flag operation. He brings up things like this. Dr. Stella Emanuel, some kind of a doctor from Africa. Pediatrician, yeah. Who believes that aliens and alien DNA are present on Earth? Who believes that People in the government are part reptilian, which may be true, actually. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, has said all of this. And when does he tweet this stuff out? When the Commerce Department says this is the lowest the, co- the economy has been in history. Yeah, that was his, that was his shining point that he was going to stand on was the strength of the economy. And if that's no good, he's got to work up something else. Exactly. And then, then last month in July, he makes a big deal over the rallies that he's having and that they're more than full and overflowing. Well, the answer came back that they were one third full. Okay. Even if that's wrong, they were one half full. They weren't more than that. So he's full of malarkey. Okay. The second thing he does there is he goes to Florida for a rally. The rally is very poorly attended. So what he says is, I'm down here to discuss the issue of illegal drugs. Now, in July of 2020, there are hardly any Americans who really have that on the top of their agenda. We're worrying about social unrest, racial unrest. We're worrying uh, about the throes of this pandemic. I mean, we have a lot of things to worry about other than that. Exactly. Quickly, another thing that he used, especially when the book came out, he talked about delaying the election. And people went bananas, their hair caught on fire, they're running around, even Congress, even uh, Mitch McConnell said, you're not going to do that. But people weren't talking as much about the book, 
even though they bought it, they sold a million the first day, nearly a million the first day? They sold 1.35 million domestically in the first week. Now, the book was also a number one bestseller in, in, in England, and it was a number two bestseller in Australia. So they're selling millions of these things because people are fed up with this baloney. All right. So let's move on now to the tweets then he uses to distract voter attention from those headlines, the crazier. And he's been going bananas with these tweets since the book what came out. He's trying all he can to hide the book, hide the bad economy, hide the bad polls, whatever he could do to keep people from looking or thinking or talking about what's real in the headlines. Well, Bill, you know, he also tried this once before, and that was they wanted to pass a bill which if you wanted an absentee ballot, you had to pay for it, $25. Now, let me ask you this. You've been to college. I've been to college. I'm going to pay 20. I'm 20 years old. I'm living in a fraternity house. I'm struggling to get my grades to get me past this semester. Am I going to go, oh, I think I'll pay $25 and vote? Then they wanted voter ID. Who needs voter ID? People without driver's license. Who are those people? Poor people, people of color. Who votes absentee? College students who are away from home. Those are two blocks of people that primarily vote against. Well, there's concern that this uh, voter fraud and the mail-in, those campaign against the mail-in ballots, that this might be a distraction, is actually an attempt to suppress voters, like you just said, uh, yeah. that voters that would be against the president. And he's harping on this all the time, practically every day. He's got a tweet out there. So he does have fears, fears of losing uh, a man that's uh, as, as, as much narcissism as he does. Uh, he can't stand to lose. I mean, when he was asked uh, earlier this week about the John Lewis funeral, the memorial services, his first reaction was, I don't have anything to say about John Lewis. He didn't come to my inauguration, so I didn't go to his funeral. He puts himself in the middle of everything. That, that's what a narcissist yeah. does. Now, I wonder, Bill, we're, I know we're going to move on to our third topic that you announced at the top of the show. Who will stand by this man and who will jump ship? That, that's the question. That's the question. And not, we're not talking about just voters, but we're talking about significant people in Washington who can uh, tell the voters how to vote. Uh, like you mentioned, Lindsey Graham or Mitch McConnell or uh, was it Jim Jordan, the, the guy from yeah. Ohio? Yeah. These are people who have supported him practically uh, to the wall. But uh, Jordan in particular seems to be in his corner. McConnell surprisingly has stood up against him. It'd be difficult to imagine him jumping ship unless uh, his reelection is challenged in some way. Can Lindsey Graham stick on his corner? I think the point here, Bill, it's an old adage, and I'll bastardize it for a minute. You can lead a horse to water, but you have to make him think he wants to drink. And I think, <laughs> I think really well, I think the answer to that is simply this. You can, you can, you know, you and I come from a broadcast background, and one of the cardinal rules of broadcast is don't ever underestimate your audience. And in this particular thing, don't ever estimate the American people. If we can convince people to not listen to us or even follow us, God forbid, but do the research, listen to the facts, listen to the numbers, listen to what's going on. A lot of Republicans came in on his coattails in, in 2016. OK, that's fine. But I think that there are many people, Republicans, Democrats, who've had enough and they're beginning to inch away. They, they don't want their political future to be tied to this mental case. They don't. There was a woman I saw on uh, CNN. She's a teacher in Oklahoma who admitted that she voted for uh, Trump. And it says now that vote, she wrote an op-ed in New York Times, Washington Post, one of the major papers. She said that now she thinks that vote is a vote for her own death. 
because the president is making these huge demands to start school and maybe school's not ready. She's a school teacher. She's not sure she wants to be in the school during the pandemic. I said all along that people have been wanting, voters have been wanting change for many years. That's why they voted for Obama in 08 and 12. They weren't getting the change in Washington that they wanted. Another change agent, Trump, comes along. They voted for him. Nobody had any idea that he was as off the rails as he is, appears, even though he told the people that he abused women and laughed about it 30 days before the election. But women still voted for him. Go figure. You have to understand that people want change in Washington, and they may not see Joe Biden as that change, but they may vote against Trump because they don't want to bring him back. They, they see that He's not the change that they want, and the change might be too radical for uh, the American voter. You know, Bill, we're going to wrap this up in a minute or two, and I know you're usually the one who wraps everything up, but we're going to do another podcast because I disagree with what you said. I don't think people want change. I don't. I think people want it exactly the way they want it, the way it is now. Now, certain people want it to change, but a lot of people don't. And I think that's a real interesting issue. And I think it's something that we should talk about before this election. Do you, American voter, really want change? Uh, or are you happy the way things are? And I'll bet you, I'll, I'll go as far as a nickel or maybe even a dime, that most people, I know that's a big bet for me. <laughs> I think that most people really don't want change. They want certain changes and certain tweaks, but, and I think that's going to be part of what we talk about coming up to election, you know? Well, that'd be an interesting conversation because I, I don't, I don't, I think people want, I think people want governance. They want people in Washington to govern, not to control, not to tell people what to think, how to think it, and when to think it. I think they want governing. They want governing. They, uh, they go, some of the people are old enough to remember Tip O'Neill, Edward Brooke, uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, all of these people who thought maybe not 180 degrees difference, but they were able to get into a room, close the door, and, and govern. That's not happening now because people on the left or the right want to just tell people what to do. And I think people want change from that. That's a subject that you and I are going to disagree on, my friend. Oh, cool. and, that, and, that, and that'll be fine. That's another day, though, because I know we're about to wrap up. I'm the one wrapping up today. And you that's usually <laughs> your job because I'm right. blabbing all day all right. So uh, here we are. We're coming to the end. Uh, I think this is a good conversation. I've had a good time with it. So uh, until we hear from you again, take care of each other and respect each other. And peace always. You can get this podcast. You can tell someone else about this podcast. It's available through YouTube, through iTunes, and through Google Play. Let's hear from you. Let us know what you think so that we can be in community with you. And there is a way to contact us. That's at peter at agnetislife.com or bill at agnetislife.com. That's our email addresses. Let's hear from you. Let's open up the forums.